Welcome to my new series of ATEM mini tips. These tips should apply to your ATEM no matter which model you have. If you have any questions that you want answers or tips that you need help with, then feel free to drop a comment below and I'll try to answer them in a future show. Today we're looking at how to automatically switch camera angles. We're using an ATEM mini today, and I'm gonna show you how to switch from camera one to two to three to four automatically using a macro. To create a macro, open the macros menu, go to the create tab, click on plus and give it a name. I'll just call this auto. The software will now record any and every action that we do inside the ATEM software, but it will not assume anything. What I mean by this is that if you want a state to be activated, you have to explicitly click it. And here's why I tell you this. Right now I'm already on camera one. And if I want my script to start on camera one, I have to actually tell it to start on camera one. So to do that, I could go to any other camera, camera two or three or anything else, and then go back to camera one. That initial click to camera two will be overwritten by the click to camera one because I have just given it a command and then given it essentially a replacement command right after it. So now I've just told the software to switch to camera one. The next thing I wanna do is insert a pause. I do want the software to eventually switch to camera two, but I don't want it to do it right away. If I don't insert a pause, then it will execute these commands as quickly as it can. So to insert a pause, you go to the top of the window where it says add pause, click on that and then give it a duration in seconds and frames. While in a real use case, you'd wanna give it a longer duration than this, I'm just gonna give it a one second duration for this demo. I'll click on add pause and then go to camera two. I'll go back to add pause and add another one. Go to camera three, add pause, add one more, and then camera four. Now at this point, I could be done with the script. If this is all that I wanted was for it to go from one to two to three to four, I'm done. But what I can also do is tell this script to loop, to play back over and over again, constantly switching from cameras one to two to three to four and back to one again. However, if I don't add a pause at the end of the switch to camera four, then as soon as the script ends, it's gonna immediately jump back to the beginning and start over, which means that I will only be on camera four for a single frame. So now I wanna add that pause at the end of camera four as well. Add the pause, add that in, and we're done. I'll now stop recording. There's the auto button, click on the run tab, Enabling recall and run will mean I only have to click on the button, or if I disable that, then I can select the button and click play. I'll go ahead and click play now and watch the program switch, the cameras that are live over here. I click on play, and there it goes from one to two to three to four. If I want that to repeat until I stop it, then I'll click this button here. That'll cause it to repeat, so now when I click play, it'll run through the macro, and then repeat when it gets to the end. When you want the script to stop running, just click the stop button. And that's all it takes to automatically switch camera angles. If you want more tips like this, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you have any questions that you want answered, drop them in the comments below. Today's ATEM mini tip is answering a question that came in from a viewer. The viewer asked how they can switch camera angles and simultaneously automatically load up a different lower third graphic over each camera. So something specific or unique to camera one, two, three, and four. To do that, we're gonna need to use macros. Let me show you first what I've set up in preparation for this. First, I have my four different camera angles. There's camera one, camera two, camera three, and camera four. Then I've created a series of lower third graphics. Here they are. There's camera one, two, three, and four. These are simply PNGs with transparency. To load these graphics into the ATEM, go to the media tab, locate your folder. Here's mine, lower thirds, and then start dragging the graphics into the media player. There's one, two, three, and four. Now back to the switcher, where we'll set up the downstream key. You can use the downstream key or the upstream key for this. However, the upstream key provides a lot of additional capabilities that we don't actually need for this. So we're gonna save that for something else. The downstream key is totally sufficient. Also, the downstream key is the last part of the chain, meaning that this graphic will sit on top of anything else that we might create, which is perfect for a lower third or a bug or anything like that. To set this up, we first need to set up the fill source. It's already set to media player one where I want it, and the key source is also set to media player one key. That's what's gonna give us the transparency of this PNG file. Now this PNG is very simple. It's just a on or off transparency. There's no drop shadow or gradient or anything like that. To apply graphics with gradients, drop shadows, and so on, you actually have to load the graphic a bit differently, which is something we'll cover in another video. For now, we have these simple PNGs already loaded and ready to go. I want my mask off, because I'm not masking any of this out, and I want my pre-multiplied key turned on. The only thing that's left to do is to turn on the DSK and bring it on air. And there we have it. There's our lower third graphic over this camera angle. But of course, as I switch camera angles from one to two to three to four, that same lower third graphic is in place. 
So now we need to build up macros to automatically switch the camera angle and load up the appropriate graphic. So to do that, we'll go up to the macros menu and select the create tab and then click plus. I'm going to call this camera one plus LT for lower third and then hit record. Now remember, anything that you want the macro to do has to be explicitly recorded. So for example, here we're already on camera one, but the macro doesn't know that. So we have to explicitly switch to camera one to load camera one. To do that, since we're already here, I'll just load another camera angle and then come back to this one. I'll go to camera two and then back to camera one. And that has now just written camera one into the script. Technically, I just recorded camera two and then camera one, but the software knows that the camera one switch overrides the camera two switch and it will only save that one command. Next, we need to set up the downstream key. Once again, everything has to be explicitly stated. So we want to switch to media player one. To do that, we'll switch to anything else and then back to media player one. And the same thing with the key. So we'll switch away and then back again. I don't want the mask, so I'm going to turn that on and then off to make sure that that is told to go off. And the pre-multiplied key I want on, so I'll turn it off and back on again. Next, we need to make sure that the correct graphic is loaded. So back to the media tab. Again, it's already loaded, but we're going to take camera one and drag that in just so we know that that loads up when we run this macro. Back to the switcher. And the last stage is to turn the DSK on. I'll go ahead and turn it off and then back on again. And that completes the macro. I'll stop recording. And just to test it out, we'll go ahead and turn this off, switch over to camera two, go to the run command, recall and run is set, which means I only have to click this button. And there we go. Camera one with the lower third loaded. Now we need to repeat this for the other camera angles. I'll do number two. Back to the create tab, I'll click the plus again and put camera two plus lower third. Hit record, load up camera two. Once again, explicitly say that this is media player one, media player one key, mask is off, pre-multiply key is on, and the media player we're gonna switch to graphic two. I've been doing it from the media tab, but I can also do it from this drop down here. Let's load up camera two. Now, once again, we're gonna go ahead and turn the DSK off and back on again. Stop recording, and now we're ready to run these. We can now switch from camera one with the lower third to camera two with its lower third. At this point, you'd go ahead and just record the additional macros for cameras three and four. But going through this process can be a little bit tedious and it's certainly prone to error. If you forget to do something, you may not realize that until it's too late and you're running this in production. So in the next tip that I release, I'm gonna show you how to start with the camera one plus LT that we already recorded. And then by modifying the XML file, we're gonna go ahead and create cameras two, three, and four without having to record anything additional. And of course, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. It's a good way to make sure that I know that you like these tips and want more of them. And if you have a specific question or a specific tip that you wanna get answered, Go ahead and drop a comment below and I'll do my best to hit it in a future video. In the previous ATEM mini tip, I showed you how to create a macro that allowed you to switch camera angles and also load up a different lower third over each camera angle. However, the problem with that process of creating the macros by recording them over and over and over again is that they're quite prone to error. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to take the first recording that we did in the previous video and then replicate that out for cameras two, three, and four using XML editing. Here are the two macros that we created in the previous video, camera one plus lower third and camera two plus lower third. Just to test them out again, we'll go to run and load up camera one plus LT and camera two plus LT, and they're working fine. But I wanna go ahead and create them for three and four. And in fact, I'm also gonna create the one for camera two all over again. I'm just gonna go back into the create tab, select camera two and delete it. So we only have the first one created. I'm gonna go ahead and save this out as an XML file. Go to file, save as, Give it any name you like. I'll just call it camera switching. Hit save. And here in this window, I can choose what I want saved into the XML file. In this case, I don't want all of this. I only want the macros. So I'm gonna click on select none and then select macros and save that. It'll just make it easier to manipulate the file later. Next, I'll switch over to BB edit, which I like to use to edit these files. I'm gonna go ahead and open the file that we just created. And from here, we can see exactly what this macro is made of. There's the macro, index zero, that's the first macro in the list. There's the name we gave it, camera one plus LT for lower thirds. And then here's all the different commands. Program input was set to camera one. The key fill was set to media player one, and there's the key source for it as well. We disabled the mask, so you can see the mask is set to false. We enabled the pre-multiply, so there's pre-multiply set to true. And then we chose the media player source, which was that first graphic, which is showing up as index zero. 
Now this can definitely get a little bit confusing because the index number is not the same as the number in the software for that particular graphic. Let me show you what I mean. This is set to index zero. However, if we look at the media player, it was actually graphic number one. This is position zero. This is position one, position two, position three, and so on. This applies to the macros as well. You'll notice that our macro is set as index zero, but it's actually in position one. So again, it's confusing, but whenever you're dealing with these, you have to know that you are loading up a different number than the one that you need. All right, let's go back into the BB edit. And here we can see the downstream key on air was actually disabled and then enabled. Curiously, it actually recorded that turning it off. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that line because we don't want it. We don't want it to turn it off and back on. We just wanna leave it on. All right, now I wanna go ahead and duplicate this three more times. So we'll go ahead and select all of this from the opening of the macro to the closing of it. I'll hit Command C to copy that, put the cursor here, and then just go paste, paste, paste to give us three more of them. Now I need to change each one of these for each camera angle. There's a few things I have to do. So it's index zero, camera one. Let's change this one to index one, and we'll set that to camera two. This one will be index two, and we're gonna set that for camera three. And this one is index three, and set that to camera four. Next, let's look at the camera inputs. This one's set to camera one. This one is going to switch to camera two, to camera three, and to camera four. Finally, we need to change the graphic. The graphic is index zero. Here's the graphic right here. That's index zero. This one's gonna be set to index one, index two, and index three. And of course, if you're ever confused at which one you're switching to, simply check out in your software, the media player, it was number four that we wanted to load in position four, subtract one from that to get to the index number, and there we go, index three. That's it. This should be everything we need to do to save all four of these buttons as macros. I'm gonna go ahead and save this, but I'm gonna do a save as, and just a little tip on how I like to do this. Under the save as, there's always a date and time automatically added by the ATEM software. I'll go ahead and update that timestamp so that it reflects the current time. It is currently six minutes after the hour, so I'm gonna say six, and dash zero zero. The dash zero zero is for me replacing the seconds, but also an indicator to me that that is one that I created. It's just how I do things. We'll go ahead and save that. Go back over to the ATEM software and from the file menu, restore, and we'll choose the new one that I just created. Restore that. It asks what I want to restore. In this case, macros is the only thing available. Click restore, load up our macros. And there they are, camera one, two, three, and four with the appropriate lower third. All that's left is to test it out. Go to the run, make sure recall and run is enabled, and we'll switch to camera two, camera three, camera four, and back to camera one again. This is a great way to take total control over your macros. Yes, it's a little bit complicated and it does take some getting used to, but once you get comfortable with manipulating the XML file, you'll find that you can go in and start copying, pasting individual lines of code from one macro into another, making it easy to combine complicated macros into one. You can also save off multiple macro files, open those up and copy and paste one macro command into another file, just making sure to always give each macro a unique index number. That's a common mistake. If you have multiple macros with the same index number, you're gonna be missing one inside of the macro list. So just open up that XML file and make sure that each one has a unique index number. Other than that, have some fun figuring this out. It's again, complicated, but it's worth the effort. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe so I know that you wanna see more of these videos. And if you have any questions that you want answered, any tips that you're trying to figure out, drop them into the comments below. I'll try to get to it. In today's ATEM mini tip, we'll be looking at how to create proper graphics with proper transparency for your ATEM. This could be for an ATEM Mini, ATEM Mini Pro, ATEM Mini Pro ISO, ATEM Mini Extreme, ATEM, Ed, you get the idea. Any ATEM model, this applies. Now, we're going to build this through a series of progressions because when you start off with a basic transparent file, a basic PNG with no drop shadow, no gradients, nothing fancy, you don't need to do anything special. Just output a PNG and you're fine. And we'll look at that. But as soon as you start adding drop shadows, things get a little bit tricky. You might add a drop shadow and export as PNG and it looks uh, okay. You probably don't even notice the difference until you look really closely. But then if you start doing things a bit more fancy, like having gradient transparencies, then things can get pretty ugly pretty quickly. So we're gonna look at all of that. We're gonna look at how to create the proper graphic using Photoshop because there's actually a plugin that comes with your ATEM that is installed by default when you install your ATEM software into your Photoshop plugins, 
But if you don't have Photoshop, then you can't use that. So at the end, I'm going to show you how to do this without Photoshop as well. Let's get started. Today, we'll be using the ATEM Mini Pro ISO, but again, this applies no matter what ATEM you're using. I'm going to start with Photoshop. We'll create a new document. I'm going to go to the Film and Video Presets to choose HDTV, 1920 by 1080. That's the size of my output. And I'm going to set the background contents to transparent. Click Create. And I'm just going to do something really simple. I'll grab the text tool, click it on here, and type in Photo Joseph. I'm going to make this nice and big on here. You can see I've already got a bright yellow color selected. And then I'll add a drop shadow. I'm just going to do this with the Photoshop tools, go to the Effects tab, add a drop shadow, and I'm going to make it really big and bold like this. Click OK, and that's it. Now to export this as a PNG. I'll go Export As. It's set to PNG. We have transparency enabled, and that's all I have to do. Click Export. I'll call this Photo Joseph, and save that. Now let's switch over to the ATEM software and go to the Media tab. I've already saved this ATEM files folder as a favorite, which by the way, if you don't know how to do that, you can right click on any folder and add or remove from favorites. There's the file that I just created. I'll go ahead and drag that into the still store and that automatically loads it up into Media Player One. Now let's go back to the switcher. I'm gonna to go to my downstream key. It's set to Media Player One with the key source, that's the alpha channel being set to Media Player One key, which is what I want. And I'm going to leave pre-multiply key off for now and go ahead and bring this on air. So there's the graphic. Now you can see the transparency and you can see the drop shadow and you can see that it's um, not exactly right. There's some weird edging to it. Okay, well, let's turn on pre-multiply. I'll turn that on and it's better. This is definitely better. And for the most part, this is perfectly fine. So if all you're doing is adding a drop shadow, try it like this. And if it works, it works and you're good to go. It kind of depends on the graphic. But now let me show you where this breaks. Let's go back over to Photoshop. And I'm going to create a rectangle in here, just a simple shape. And then I'm going to add a mask to that. Grab the gradient tool by hitting the G key. And I'm just going to drag a gradient across just to give it this transparency. So all we have now is a big box that goes from solid to transparent yellow. And you can see that it falls off somewhere around here. It goes to completely transparent. So just remember, right around the E to PH in Photo Joseph, that is really dropping off to total transparency. Now let's export this out as a PNG. And this one we'll call Photo Joseph plus Grad. Back over to the ATEM software, back in the Media tab. There it is. We'll drag it in. And right now it looks just fine. Let's go ahead and drag this into place here and it's gonna immediately load up and we see a huge problem in here. That is not okay. So clearly we have broken things. All right, well, let's just go back and see what's happened here. We've enabled pre-multiplied key. So the software is looking for a pre-multiplied key, but this isn't a pre-multiplied key. Now what is a pre-multiplied key? We'll get into that a little bit, but for now, this isn't it. So let me just turn that off. Oh, well, that's better, right? But hold on, look at the drop shadow. The drop shadow is back to its kind of weirdness. Well, I do have some options down here. I mean, I can play with the clipping and try and make that a little bit better and maybe just the gain on that. Well, we can see where that falls apart pretty quickly. And you might once again find something that you're happy-ish with, but this is definitely not going to be correct. What's correct is to export a pre-multiplied key. So what does that actually mean? Well, a pre-multiplied key has the alpha channel drawn against a rendered out black or white. In this case, the ATEM software is looking for black. And what that means is that your transparency needs not to fade to transparent, but fade to transparent with black blended in. Now, how do we know this? Well, we'll come to that. But let's go ahead and look at how to do this using Photoshop the easy way. Back into Photoshop, the exact same document, I'm gonna to go to the file menu and under export, you'll find the ATEM switcher media pool option. This is a plugin that is automatically installed when you install your ATEM software. The first thing we have to do is enter the IP address of our switcher. If you don't know what that is, switch back over to the ATEM setup software, jump into here, and you'll find the IP address right there. So 10.01.105, that's the IP address for my switcher. And there we have it. I can name my export. I'm gonna go ahead and call this one plugin. So I know this came from the plugin. I can choose where I'm gonna drop that. We'll drop that into media pool location three. It even tells me that it's empty. We're going to tell it that this is a pre-multiplied alpha. This is an important step to check that checkbox is what's going to make this work. And then you can also choose to have it after export do nothing or actually automatically set it to Media Player 1. 
What this means is that once I export it, it's going to drop it into this spot here and load it up into here at the same time. This is actually really cool. This means that you can create graphics on the fly during a live production and send those graphics live to air from Photoshop. Neat. But let's get back to this. I'll switch over to Photoshop. Again, we've named it Plugin. It's going to Media Player 3. It's going to set it live to air. Click Export and it loads it into the ATEM and it loads it up on air but it's still not totally right. Let's go back over to the ATEM software, go to the switcher, and pre multiply key is not turned on. Let's go ahead and turn that on. And now we have the right transparency. Look at the drop shadow and look at the gradient. The gradient is ending where we wanted it to, and the drop shadow looks really, really good and clean. So this is the way it's supposed to look. This is what we want. Okay, but this required a plugin in Photoshop. So what is it doing? Well, remember I explained the pre multiply key. Let's take a look at what the actual output file looks like. The way to do that is to save the output from the ATEM into a new folder where we'll be able to see the graphics that this plugin actually created. Ending where we wanted it to, and the drop shadow looks really, really good and clean. So this is the way it's supposed to look. This is what we want. Okay, but this required a plugin in Photoshop. So what is it doing? Well, remember I explained the pre multiply key. Let's take a look at what the actual output file looks like. The way to do that is to save the output from the ATEM into a new folder where we'll be able to see the graphics that this plugin actually created. So let's go back into the ATEM software. I'll go to File, Save As. I'm just gonna call this Export and click Save. And on this menu, I'm gonna turn off everything except for the media pool. This is going to save out the graphics that are currently stored on the ATEM. Click Save. It'll export those out. Let's go ahead back over to the Finder. There's the ATEM Media Pool folder. And here's the three graphics. So there's the original one that I created, the Photo Joseph one without the gradient. Then here's one with the gradient in place. You can see what that PNG looks like. And then here's the one generated by the plugin. Look at how the gradient fades out to black. It's this weird thing that normally would not look right but in a pre-multiplied environment is what we need. So that's what we have to create. We have to figure out how to create that PNG with the black, with the pre-multiplied black, without using the plugin. So to do that, we're gonna to switch to another app just to show that you don't need to use Photoshop. I'm gonna use Affinity Photo. In Affinity Photo, I'm gonna go ahead and open up that original PNG that I made. So Photo Joseph plus Gradient, that's the one that came out of Photoshop. And here's the steps. First thing you have to do is duplicate the layer. Then we'll go ahead and hide that top layer, create a new layer. I'll move this to the very back here. And I wanna fill this with black. So I'll go to the edit menu, fill, and I'm gonna fill this with black. Now I need to take these two layers and merge them together. Right click and choose merge visible. We can now get rid of these extra ones here. There's the one that we've just created. And then here is that original background layer that we created. Remember, if I hide this and turn this one back on, that's where we started. We actually need to load a selection from this layer. So I'm going to go to the Select menu and choose Selection from Layer. Now we'll go ahead and hide this and go back to this one here, which is merged with the black background, and create a mask for that. To do that, simply click the Mask button. There is our mask. I'll deselect that, and here's the end result. You can see in here how it's fading out to black, just like what we had before in that PNG that was generated by the plugin. So now I'll export this as a PNG. Go to the File menu and Export as a PNG file. Export that, and we're going to call this one Affinity Version. Hit Save. Back over to the ATEM software, into the Media Pool. There's the Affinity version. We'll drag that into place, drag that on, and with pre multiply key enabled, we can see that the key looks correct. So let's just do that one more time, but without going through the whole process of exporting a PNG and bringing it back in again. I'll create a new file in Affinity Photo, and of course, this will work in any graphic software. Once again, 1920 by 1080, and I also have transparent background enabled here. Click Create, and let's do something crazy. I'll go ahead and do the Photo Joseph again in there, because why not? Let's make that some other color. I'll put not just a drop shadow. Let's go ahead and enable that and make that nice and big and soft on there. Make that pretty dark as well. 
but I'm also going to add a glow on here because that would definitely break things. So let's make this a bright yellow glow. We'll put that behind the text in there. Maybe make that drop shot a little bit bigger. Then I'll also do a shape. Let's go ahead and draw what would be a lower third in the end. And let's put on a gradient on this. We're obviously getting crazy here and doing something really ugly, but that's okay. It's just to make a point. I'll put a mask on here and grab the gradient tool and just make that really nice and soft. Drag that out like so. Grab the arrow tool. Let's take this text here and we'll put that on top. And again, we're really doing something that's ugly, but no doubt this is something that would not work without the pre-multiplied channel. Okay, so we've created all of this at this point, but now we don't want to have to export it out as a PNG and re-import it, et cetera, et cetera. So here's what we'll do. Go ahead and select these two items here and group them. I'll duplicate this, hide the top one, and create a new layer underneath this that I'll once again fill with black. Now I'll go ahead and merge down, select that top layer. You do have to enable it to load the transparency, so enable that temporarily. Go to the Select menu and choose Selection from Layer. Then we can go ahead and hide that, select that background layer, and create the mask. There you can see the fading off to black that we need. So let's go ahead and export this out as that PNG file that we need. And we're just going to call this one Fancy. Hit save. Back over to the ATEM software. Take that. Load that into place. And there we go. Verify that pre multiply key is turned on. And of course it is. And now you have the beautiful gradients, the shadows, the glows, and everything works right. So that's how you create these graphics. They have to be pre multiplied if you want to have your transparency and your opacity look the way it was intended to. Again, you might be able to get away without doing that with generating just a simple PNG if all you have is a simple drop shadow. But if you're seeing some anomalies in your drop shadow, this is why. Generate the graphic this way, either using the plugin from Photoshop or using the technique I just showed you, and that's all you need. Hey, as always, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, share this video with another ATEM user that you know, and if you have any tips that you want to see done, make sure you drop them in a comment below. I'll do my best to get to them. Thanks. In this ATEM mini tip, I'm going to show you how and where to download the software to keep your ATEM hardware up to date. If you've just bought your ATEM hardware, it didn't actually come with any software. You have to download it. And I gotta say, the instructions that are in the box and where to find them, not that clear. So you might be watching this having never have downloaded the software and wondering where to get it, or you might already have it but aren't sure how to update it. So we're going to cover that right now. First thing you have to do is go to the Blackmagic Design website, blackmagicdesign.com and then click on the support tab. And then under search by model, type in ATEM mini or whatever model you have. The software is actually the same for pretty much all, if not every single ATEM model, but just to be safe, you can type in the full name or find the model here. I'm going to be looking at the ATEM mini pro ISO, so I'll select that one. Now, just to add a little bit of confusion to the interface here, once you do that, nothing changes here except that a box highlights. And if you scroll down, then you'll finally see the software that you need to download. The latest update as of this recording was from the 18th of February, 2021. It's version 8.6. Click on the button to download either macOS or Windows. If you haven't yet registered your hardware, I definitely recommend you do that. Or if you have, then just click on download now. Once the software is downloaded, locate it in your downloads folder. Double click the disk image. And if you're on Windows, I guess it's an EXE. I'm sorry, I don't know, but I'm sure you can figure that part out. And from the DMG that mounts, double click on the installer. That's going to install a Blackmagic ATEM folder that has all the software you need. The two main pieces are the ATEM setup and the ATEM software control. Launch the ATEM setup and navigate to your switcher. If you only have one switcher connected, then that will come right up. From here, you have two options. You can either click this button, which will launch the ATEM software, or this one, which will launch the setup. If there is an update available for your hardware, as soon as you click this button, it's going to prompt you to update. Now, the nice thing is it will not force you to update. It will actually allow you to continue. So if you have to get to work right now, you don't have time to update, you can bypass that. But as soon as you can, come back in here, open this interface again, and it'll prompt you to update. 
The update procedure is pretty quick. It'll just run through its process, reboot your ATEM, and you'll have the latest software in there. And that's all there is to it. I definitely recommend checking for updates pretty regularly. Blackmagic releases updates to their ATEM hardware lineup pretty often, and quite often they have really cool new features in them. So definitely check this out every once in a while, or just watch for videos on this channel, where of course I'll tell you if there's anything new that you want to install on your ATEM. As always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video with another ATEM user. And if you have any specific questions that you want answered, drop them into the comments below. Today's ATEM mini tip is all about controlling the picture-in-picture, -picture, or the PIP, in your ATEM hardware and software. This tip applies to any ATEM, however, it's primarily focused at the ATEM Mini, ATEM Mini Pro, ATEM Mini Pro ISO, ATEM Mini Extreme, and ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, because those are the ones that have the hardware buttons on them to control the picture-in-picture, -picture, which you want to watch out for. However, as far as controlling this in software goes, everything I show you here will apply to any model. So first, let's take a look at what we have on the hardware. You have on here a series of buttons to enable picture-in-picture. -picture. There's the off and the on button that just turns that on and off. And then you have a series of buttons to load up preset picture-in-picture -picture positions. The bottom left, top left, top right, and bottom right. These buttons here are a little bit dangerous because if you push one of those buttons after you've spent time configuring your picture-in-picture -picture the way that you want it, it might actually reset everything. So you got to be careful of that. So I'm going to show you first how to set up the picture-in-picture -picture however you want it. I'm going to give you a little bit of a nod towards something else that you can do in here, although there's a lot of options that we're not going to cover today. And then I'm going to show you, most importantly, how to save the work that you've done so you don't lose it. Let's get started. The first thing I want to look at is what's actually happening when you push this button. As I turn this on and off, you'll see a couple things happening. First of all, you see the picture in picture showing up in the video stream. So there's a picture in picture of myself there. Not terribly exciting yet. But look at the software interface. Notice up here, this is the upstream key. And as I turn this on or off, that is what is being brought on air and off air. This on air right here indicates that the upstream key is on air. And this is your upstream key. What's inside of that upstream key is determined by the fill source. It's currently set to this camera, the main camera here, which I could change in here to any other source. For example, here I have a little running loop of a stock video, but what would actually make more sense is to leave this as me and then to change the background, the primary stream, as that background video. So now we've got a more traditional picture-in-picture -picture type setting. And again, if I change the position of these, all it's doing is moving me into one of those other corners. But let's look at how to take control over this. Again, this is an upstream key, and it's a DVE upstream key. DVE stands for Digital Video Effects, and it's just the basic type of upstream key that we have on AATEM hardware. We already saw the fill source. Underneath this, you have position, size, masking, shadow, and border controls. There's more as we go down here as far as animations go, but we're not going to get into that today. By the way, at any point, you can go up to this menu and reset any of these characters or go ahead and choose Reset All to reset everything back to its default position. And this is the hardware's default position. Now we've got the picture-in-picture, -picture, the upstream key of me, centered, scaled, and not cropped. Once again, if I hit the hardware in here, though, it's going to immediately push that back into those other positions. So if, let's just say, that this position happened to be what we really wanted, hitting one of those buttons on the ATEM itself is going to reset that. But now let's look at the controls that we have in here. First, you have your position controls. I can control these by clicking on the arrows here to move them. I can click in this field and then use the arrows on my keyboard to move them as well. Or I can just punch in a number. So if I wanted to say 3.0, I can do that. There's also a size in here. I can change the size of this, make it a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. You'll notice that the X and Y axes are locked. However, I can actually unlock this. So if you wanted to scale and stretch something for some reason, you could do that as well. I'll go ahead and relink these. And then I'm going to set the size to 1, which is 100% and makes it full screen. However, you can actually make this bigger. You can zoom in pretty far. This was a feature that was added at some point in the software. And um, you, can, you can go anyway. Let's not do that. Next is the mask. It's by default set to zero, not masking anything. But if we go in here and start typing in numbers or moving this with the cursor, you'll see that we can start to mask the image. You can crop the top, bottom, left, or right on this. And what's probably most common would be to crop off part of the edges on here to give yourself a smaller picture in picture. If you just wanted to crop a square out of a video feed, for example, this is how you would do that. You can add a drop shadow to this, but make no mistake, this is not a fancy drop shadow. It doesn't even have blur to it. 
You can change the position of that. You can change the altitude of that, just, just how far it goes, but that's about it. You can also drag in this little guy here to reposition that. But as you can see there, it's this is not a fancy drop shadow, so don't get too excited. You can add a border to this. The border allows you to change the color, so you can set any color that you want in here, which you can do with the color picker, or you can do with the hue, saturation, and luminance controls, which is extremely important because if you are going to build the color choice into a macro, you're going to want to define the hue, saturation, and luminance inside of the macro. You can change the outer width, the inner width of that border. You can soften it, which kind of like the shadow is not really all that exciting, but it's there if you want it. I'm going to go ahead and set all these back to their basics. We'll leave a simple outer width on here, and you also have a border opacity, so you can make that solid or a bit transparent. Again, none of this is terribly exciting, but you do have the ability to do it if you need it. Most likely, if you're going to use this, you'd keep it pretty simple. You'd probably leave the border opacity at 100%, set a nice simple outer width, let's just say 1 or even 0.5 on there, and then set a simple color like a basic white just to ensure that you have a nice clean border. And let's get rid of that silly shadow on there as well. So those are the basic controls that you have over the DVE upstream key. Now I said that I'd give you a nod of some of the other things that are in here. If we scroll back up to the top of this list, you'll see that you have four different types of upstream keys. There's Luma keys, Chroma keys, Pattern keys, and the DVE keys. The Luma and Chroma keys are quite complex and quite powerful. We'll cover those in other videos. If you're interested, let me know in the comments below. But for now, I do want to take a quick look at the pattern keys because these can be kind of fun. Under the pattern key right now, you'll see that this diamond shape is selected. I'm going to go ahead and set it to the circle shape. And then under here, you'll see that I can change the size of that circle, the symmetry of it. So if I want to squish that out a little bit, make it a bit more oval, I can put some softness on the edge of that if I want to and then change the position of the circle itself. Now, this is the position of that crop. So if I wanted to have a circular picture in picture type of a thing, and I wanted to let the person sit wherever they wanted to on frame, I can go ahead and move that circle over their face. And then from here, go down to the flying key position and position where they are. There's the size currently set at 50% and then the position in here, which I can now move to wherever I'd like. Let's put that up in the top. Let's go ahead and fix that symmetry as well to make it more like a real circle. And now let's go ahead and save this. This is the upstream key position that I want to save that I want to be able to recall at any time. As you might have guessed, we're going to need to use a macro to do this. So let's go to the macros menu, open the macro page, select a new blank one here under the create tab, click on plus, and I'll call this circle PIP for picture in picture and hit record. Now, as always, when recording a macro, you do have to explicitly record everything that you want the macro to do. It assumes nothing. So in this case, let's start by building out this picture in picture. We'll go up here to the type of upstream key. We don't want a DVE key. We want a pattern key. So I'm going to switch away from pattern and back to pattern so that now a pattern key is enabled. The fill source needs to be defined. It's going to be the picture of me. So I'll go ahead and switch it to something else and then back to me again. We need the right shape, so we'll select away and back to that. Invert pattern, you probably would never use this, but we want to make sure that it doesn't accidentally end up inverted. So let's go ahead and toggle that as well. Next, let's go to the size. Now, as we go through each one of these fields, I could move the slider on here to get it dialed in, or since I've already meticulously put it into place, I'm going to go ahead and just click on here and then tap up on my keyboard and down again, just hitting the up and down arrows just to change the number and then change it back to where it just was. That will write that into the code. So we've just done that one. I go here, up, down, up, down, position, up, down, up, down. We want the mask off in this case, so we'll turn it on and back off. We want the flying key on, so we'll turn it off and back on. The position again, up, down, up, down, size, up, down. That's written that into place. And now we're ready to go, except of course, we need to make sure that it's turned on. So we'll turn it off and back on again. And there's our upstream key. Now I seem to reposition myself in here, but we'll leave it there. We'll go ahead and stop recording. You can see that's saved, go back to the run position and it's ready to go. Let's just switch it away from this. Let's go ahead and switch it back to the default DVE key that's built into the hardware. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the button down here to do that. Oh, wait a second. Notice that the on button is flashing here. In fact, at this point, if I push these buttons, they're all going to flash and nothing actually changes. This is because we have moved away from the DVE upstream key. So as long as we're off of that tab, those buttons aren't going to hurt us. But again, if we're on that tab 
it will overwrite whatever we've done. So since those buttons are no longer doing anything, I'm going to go ahead back over here and switch it in software back to DVE. As soon as I go to that tab, though, now these work again. So now I can turn that on or off and I can change the position back to those defaults. But of course, what we want is to bring up the circle picture in picture. Recall and run is enabled. One click of that. And there we are back to the position of where I left it. So that is how you build a picture in picture in the ATEM software, taking complete control over its crop, position, scale, and everything else. And then of course, how you write that into memory by saving it as a macro that you can recall at any time. Of course, as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this tip with another ATEM user. And if you have any burning questions that you want answered about your ATEM hardware or software, drop them into the comments below and I'll be sure to get to it. In this ATEM Mini tip, we'll look at how to connect a variety of devices other than a camera to your ATEM Mini. We'll start with a computer, one of the most common devices to want to integrate, but we'll also look at connecting an iPad, an iPhone, a wireless Chromecast and AirPlay receiver, an HDMI receiver, so you could wirelessly connect a camera from across the room, an ATEM streaming bridge, which would allow you to connect to a camera from across the world, and a dedicated video player. I've got all this already connected to an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, but it's a bit too much to fit on my desk here, so let's step into the main studio. All right, as you can see, I've got a lot of stuff hooked up to this ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. In fact, I have something on every single one of the eight inputs right now, which is kind of impressive. I'm gonna run through everything that's in here right now, and then we'll go back through and talk about how each one is connected. And while we're doing that, I'll talk about various things you might wanna know as far as hooking these up, little tips and tricks and so on. So let's just start with input one, which is the camera. I've got just a BGH1 here plugged in, so I'm just straight HDMI into this. Nothing fancy here, it's just my camera input. Now we go to camera two. Camera two is my laptop. So I've got my MacBook Air here connected in on camera two. On camera three, I've got the iPad. On four, I've got an iPhone. On five, I've got something called the mirror screen, which is a wireless Chromecast slash AirPlay receiver. Really inexpensive and really, really useful. So definitely highly recommend you check one of these out. The next input number six is a Hollyland wireless HDMI receiver that's hooked up to a camera over there. Hello. And it's just a way to get another camera into the device without having to run a long cable to it. Number seven is the ATEM streaming bridge. Now this could be streaming from anywhere in the world, but it is just now streaming from my office over there that I just walked out of. And then finally on number eight, I have a very, very basic HDMI video player that's just looping some video. So we'll talk about all of these and how they're connected, starting with the laptop. Now the laptop here is connected over USB-C, but let me back up and talk about some other ways you might wanna connect. You might have a computer that has an HDMI port on it. Go figure, some of them still have those. If you've got HDMI out of your computer, all you need is an HDMI cable from the computer into the ATEM, and that's it. Now we will talk about some of the setup things in a moment, but that's all you're gonna to need to physically connect it. If your computer has display port or mini display port, then just get a mini display port or display port to HDMI cable or to HDMI adapter and then a straight HDMI cable. That'll work too. In my case here on this M1 MacBook Air, I only have USB-C. So I have here a USB-C to HDMI cable, which actually works great. I found a brand that has been really reliable for me. I'm gonna put the link to these down below. They come in some pretty long lengths and I've been digging these cables. They work great and it's just one cable to connect them. But that's not the only option. You can also get a USB-C to HDMI adapter. This is one from Belkin. And over here on the iPad, I have the one made by Apple. These both will work here, and these actually provide some other advantages if you're doing things like HDR editing work and you want to be able to view some of these devices on an HDR monitor. But as far as connecting into the ATEM itself, these are definitely overkill. This simple cable will work, but if you've got one of these, that'll work as well. All right, once you've got it connected, your computer can operate in one of two modes, either in a screen mirroring mode, where the same thing you see on your computer display will show up in the ATEM, or in a dual screen display, where you have this screen and then a separate display coming into the ATEM. And what you choose to use will just depend on how you're using it. But I also wanna talk about some problems that you might have when you connect a computer to the ATEM. If you connect them and you're just not seeing an image on the ATEM itself, here's what to look for. I'm gonna start by going to the system preferences and opening up the displays. Now I am of course doing this on a Mac. If you're on a PC, I can't walk you through those steps, but you will find these basic same settings there. First thing I'm gonna do is click on this button down here that says gather windows. This actually brings over the display settings for the Blackmagic connected device so that I can control both devices from this screen. So if I don't see the window with that BMD HDMI monitor control panel, on my Blackmagic device, then hit that button to bring both windows over to this screen so you can see what's wrong. 
By default, the resolution will be set to default for display, and this absolutely should work. But if it doesn't, you can click on Scaled and see a variety of alternate resolutions. Now again, you should be seeing 1920 by 1080 here, but what if you're not? I have seen situations where, not with this Blackmagic device, but with others, where instead of showing 1920 by 1080, the Mac is trying to connect at 1920 by 1200, and therefore the receiving device can't see it. It just doesn't understand what to do with that resolution. If you don't see 1920 by 1080 here under the scaled, I'll show you a little trick. If you hold down the option key and then click on scaled, it shows you a bunch of alternate resolutions. And in there, you should find that 1920 by 1080. Again, it should just work straight out of the box, nothing special to do, but if it doesn't, this is where you go. Now, if you select 1920 by 1080 and it still isn't working, there's one more thing you can check. See under here, there's a refresh rate option. By default, mine is set to 60 Hertz, but you might wanna play with different refresh rate settings to find one that syncs up. If your A10 mini is set to 1080p 2997, then the 60 Hertz or 30 Hertz should be synced up automatically and that should work. If you're doing it at 1080p 25 in a PAL region, then the 25 Hertz or 50 Hertz should work and it should find those automatically. And if you've set your A10 to 24p, then the 24 Hertz should work. But again, if it's not finding it automatically, you can change these manually. And once you've set that, you should never have to set it again because the Mac will remember the last device it was connected to. Next, let's look at the arrangement. I currently have this set up as a dual display arrangement, but if I click on mirror displays, then I'll be able to see the same thing on this screen as I do on the ATEM. This might be useful if you wanted to use this for video playback. You wanna be able to open a video, go full screen and hit play and have your audience see what you're seeing here. On the other hand, if you're doing something like a slideshow from Keynote or PowerPoint, then being able to have those two separate displays is awesome. This will let you have your current and next slide and even your notes on this screen while your audience is seeing the full screen slideshow. Let's take a look at how that works. I'll go ahead and switch over to Keynote where I've got a presentation ready to go and click on play. And as soon as I do that on my Mac screen, I see my current slide and my next slide while the ATEM, the audience, is only seeing the current slide. I can also change the display on the Mac here. For example, if I wanted to show my presenter notes, I can bring those up and then I see my notes in here, like here it's telling me not to forget to tell you guys to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Now's a great chance to do that. Hit that thumbs up too, share the video, you know the drill. Anyway, back over to this, if I want to advance through my next slides, I can do that. Always see the next slide up on screen here. And again, the audience is seeing just what I want them to see. Now I can also integrate myself into this. And this is one of the advantages of using the ATEM to show your slides. Instead of just having the slides up, I can do a picture in picture with my face sitting in the corner. Now I can do this as a standard default picture in picture on the ATEM, but we can completely customize this. That's something that I covered in the previous video. ATEM mini tip number seven showed you exactly how to build a custom preset picture in picture. I've already done that and I've got them saved as macros and because this is the ATEM Mini Extreme, there's actually macro buttons on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and call one of these up by pushing the macro one button and there I am up in the corner. So this is the power of a device like this combined with your slides and your picture in picture, the customizable picture in picture, really being able to bring this up however you want. So this is a really cool way to do things. All right, let me turn that off and go back to this screen and now we'll move on to the next device which is going to be the iPad. There's iPad on number three. Now the iPad again is connected this time over an HDMI adapter. The same USB-C to HDMI cable that I'm using on the Mac would also work on the iPad. I'm just using this for now. And when you connect this, if there's any issues at all, there's really only one place to look and that is the display settings. So let's take a look in the settings, scroll down to display and brightness, scroll down from there and you'll see connected displays at the very bottom. In this case, there really aren't many options in here. If you're connected to an HDR display, you'll see an HDR option in there. Or if you are playing back video that has some alternate resolutions, you might wanna tap on it allow display mode changes. This is not something I've ever actually needed, but it's there if you're playing back various frame rates and they're not looking quite right on the output, you can try that out. Otherwise, there's not really much to do. You plug it in and it should just work. Now let's go to the desktop on the iPad and I wanna show you something a little bit odd about this. You'll notice that the iPad image is not filling the screen of the program out. Now that makes some sense. After all, the display screen is 16 by nine, whereas the iPad is not. So we would expect to see some pillar boxing, black bars on the left and right hand side. But if you look closely, you'll see that there's black bars on the top and bottom as well. I can't exactly explain why, it's just how the output resolution of the iPad is synced up with the ATEM. And depending on your iPad, you might see a slightly different aspect ratio in there. But we can crop that out. So I've set up a couple of macros that are cropping this and doing specific things with the iPad image. The first one that I'll do 
has cropped the image and scaled it down a little bit and brought it off to the side. So now I've got a situation where maybe I want to demo on the iPad, but I still want to be on screen and it's okay to make the screen a little bit smaller. But what if I don't want to do it that way? What if I want to fill the screen and I don't want those black bars at the top? Well, here's another preset that I built. This one has cropped and scaled up. So I'm actually scaling the image up just a little bit. I think it's 110, 111%. So it's just a slight upscale to fill the screen with that. And then I've set the background to be gray. So a couple different ways that you can handle that depending on what you're doing in there. Now, one of the neat things about working with the iPad in here is if I do want to run a slideshow presentation, let's say I go back over to Keynote, I'll get the exact same output that I would get from the computer, meaning that I can see my current and next slides on the iPad while the audience can see the full screen image. So let me go back to the iPad full screen, and then I'll start this slideshow from the beginning here. And here we are once again, seeing the current and next slides on the iPad while the program out is just the current slide. Pretty cool. All right, now let's move on to the iPhone. I've got my iPhone connected here. And this, of course, is showing with big, huge black bars down the left and right side on the ATEM. So if I wanna crop these up, it's the same thing as I did with the iPad, and I've already built a macro to do this. So now I'll pull up the image of me and bring up the cropped and moved view of the iPhone. So now, once again, here I am on screen with my iPhone and you can see what's happening on the screen next to me. Pretty cool. All right, now let's move on to input number five, which is the mirror screen. The mirror screen is this very inexpensive little device I've got plugged in back here, which is just a wireless receiver that can receive both a Chromecast and an AirPlay signal, which is pretty neat. With a Chromecast, I could do something like share an Android screen. So let's bring that up next. Under the settings, when I go to the cast page, there's my ATEM Mini. I have named the mirror screen ATEM Mini, so I know what I'm looking at whenever I see it on one of my devices. And in just a moment here, we'll now see that Android phone being cast onto the screen. I'll go ahead and disconnect that. And let's jump over here to my Mac, where if I bring up Chrome, I can do the same thing. From Chrome, I can go to the three dots menu here, go to cast, choose the ATEM Mini, and then that browser tab shows up on the ATEM as a cast screen. Pretty cool and easy way to do this. And in fact, this device doesn't just do Chromecast, it also does AirPlay. So let me go ahead and turn this off from Chrome, and then I'll go to my display settings, screen mirroring, and there's the A10 Mini, allowing me to, once again, select the entire display of my Mac and over Apple AirPlay, send that to the ATEM. Next up is the Hollyland Mars 300, which is a wireless HDMI receiver. I've got this connected to a camera up there mounted up by the ceiling. It's just kind of a wide view of the scene here. And this is great for any kind of a far away shot where you don't want to run a really long cable. Now, keep in mind that there is some latency with wireless HDMI. So it's not going to be a good approach if you want to have a tight close up of someone where you'll be able to see that their dialogue might be out of sync with their mouth. However, for a far shot, a wide shot, a rear shot, some over the shoulder, this is a great option to use. So that's cooked up here, just straight HDMI into the ATEM, nothing to configure, it just works. The next display, number seven, is my ATEM streaming bridge. Now right now I'm just streaming from my office right over here. It's just streaming from the ATEM Mini Pro ISO that's on my desk straight to this device. But as you may have seen, if you've seen some of my live shows, you can actually bring in people from anywhere in the world. A camera anywhere in the world with a decent internet connection can stream directly to your ATEM streaming bridge. All they need to send to you is either an ATEM Mini Pro or better, or one of the new Blackmagic Web Presenter HD boxes. Those will also stream directly to the ATEM Streaming Bridge. So this again allows you to bring in a camera from literally anywhere in the world with an internet connection. Pretty awesome. And the last thing I have hooked up here is this tiny little really inexpensive video box. Believe me, it's not great, but it gets the job done. It just allows you to pop in a USB stick or an SD card, copy over some 1080p videos to it, and then using the remote control here, you can just navigate through and find a video and hit play. You can actually shuffle videos and randomize them or loop them like I'm doing here. The cut between videos as it stops when it starts the other isn't particularly smooth, but it gets the job done. So if you just need some video playing in the background on a constant loop, this is a great way to do that, maybe an interstitial or something like that. Anyway, as you can see, there is a ton of ways to get a bunch of different devices into your A10 Mini, from the laptop to the iPad to the iPhone to the Android phone to the video player to the streaming bridge to the wireless HDMI, the casting device. I mean, it's pretty slick what you can do. Eight inputs on this one or four on any other smaller A10 will get the job done. Now, there's one other thing I want to throw out there. Everything that I've talked about today will work on any of the ATEM Minis. The ATEM Mini, ATEM Mini Pro, ATEM Mini Pro ISO, ATEM Mini Extreme, or ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. However, 
Ironically, if you have one of the older but bigger and more expensive ATEMs, then some of this might not work without something else in between. You see, these ATEM minis all have scalers on every single input, which means that whenever you feed it, and here's a chart of what the device can accept and convert to from the Blackmagic website, will be scaled to the proper resolution for the ATEM. All the other bigger, older ATEMs don't actually have scalers on. So if you don't feed it the exact resolution and frame rate or frequency that the device is looking for, then it's just not going to show up, so you will need to insert some type of a scaler in between. Other than that, on any of the A10 minis, this is super easy to do. For the most part, it's just plug and play. I hope you enjoyed this and found this tip useful, and if there's any tips that you want, be sure to leave them in a comment below. Tell me what you're looking for next, and I'll try to get to it. Take care, and hey, don't forget to subscribe, right? See you next time. Bye-bye. Today's ATEM mini tip is a mini tip indeed. This one is simply about getting the right color to display on your ATEM when you've connected a Mac or possibly a PC. This definitely applies to Mac and it might apply to PC as well. I'm sorry, I don't actually know. The problem is the color profile. The wrong color profile will be selected by default when you first connect your Mac to your ATEM. And unless you go in and manually choose the right one, the display image won't look quite right. Now, to be honest, most people will never notice. And if you're simply doing things like playing keynote slide decks, you definitely won't see it. However, if you're using the ATEM for things like software demonstrations, especially apps that have a very dark UI like Lightroom or Final Cut Pro, then you'll definitely see the dark grays go a bit too dark, a bit too crunchy, and you won't actually be able to see all the details in the screen. Let's have a look. I'm currently in screen mirroring mode. Here's my Mac and here's the BMD display and you'll see that it's mirrored. When I look at the color options, there's only one option here, BMD HDMI. So you would think, well, that should be right, right? But it's not. If I go down here and deselect show profiles for this display only, you'll see a lot of other options. And the one that you want is right down here, the very conveniently named Simti RP431-2-2007 DCI P3. Just remember that it starts with Simti and ends with P3 and you'll find it each time. As soon as I select that, you'll see the gamma on the screen change. Let's go back and forth again. There's the default and there's the right one. Now let's take a look at this with an app in the background. I'll switch over to Lightroom first and bring my color displays back up. Let's hide this guy and here we go. This is correct. This is not. That's correct. That is not. Let's take a look at Final Cut as well. Same idea. This is not correct, but this is. Incorrect? Correct. It's a subtle change, but it makes a difference. And again, if you're doing a software demo with an app that has a dark UI, you'll really appreciate the change here. So that is the correct color profile to choose when you're running your Mac into your ATEM. Now again, this same color profile or something similar might be on PC. I would say if it doesn't look right, simply look for a color profiles option. And if you don't find the exact same SMPTE one, just try some other ones and see if there's one that looks better for your PC. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next tip. In this ATEM Mini Tip, we'll be looking at a feature that is unique to the ATEM Mini Extreme and the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. That feature would be the six macro buttons that are built into the hardware. Those six macro buttons trigger the first six macros in your collection. But what happens when you have more than six or you want to simply rearrange them? Unfortunately, there's no UI to do that, so to do it, we have to modify the XML. To show you that, let's step into Studio B. Here I have the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, and as you can see on here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six macro buttons. These buttons will trigger the first six macros that you've created in your ATEM software. But again, if you want to rearrange them, there's no interface to do that. Let me show you. In the ATEM software control, if I go to the macros menu and open this up, you'll see here that I have seven macros that I've created. Macro A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And I've labeled them as such just so it's easy to track as I move them around. Normally, obviously, you'd give them a proper name. If I want to move one of these, I can't. There's no way to simply drag and drop these around, which admittedly would be nice, but it's just not how it works. So for this example, I want to take macro G and move it into the A position so that it will be triggered by the macro button one. Of course, if I don't want to do that, I can simply go to the run menu here hit recall and run, and just trigger whichever macro I would like. But in this case, if I want to actually assign them to the hardware buttons, I'm gonna to have to move them. So here's how we do it. To do that, I'll go to the Save As menu, and I'll give it a name. I'm just gonna call this Macros, and I'll put it on the desktop. This is going to save out the XML file, which we will need to edit. From the Save menu, all I really care about right now are the macros, so to make things easier, I'll select None, 
and then turn on macros and then click save. I'll hide the ATEM software control and here's the file that I want to edit. I like to work on these using BB Edit, but you can use any text editor that you like. The nice thing about BB Edit is how it color codes and automatically spaces the code. I'm going to collapse all of these by option clicking on this collapse triangle here and then clicking on it again without the option key held down to expand it. By holding down the option key when I first clicked it to collapse it, it collapsed all the subcategories as well, making it easier now to see what I'm looking at. I'll open up the macro pool, and here we can see the macros that I've created. There's macros A through G with index numbers 0 through 6. Now, yes, the index numbers are confusing. The index numbers start at 0, whereas the macro position buttons start at 1. It's just the way it is. It's this way throughout the system. Everything starts at 0 in the code, not at 1. You just have to keep this in mind when you're modifying things. Okay, so remember, I wanted to move macro G into position 1. Right now, macro G is in index 6, which would be position 7, but there isn't one. So I'm going to take index 6 and change that to 0. Again, 0 being position 1. Now I can't have two macros occupying the same space, so I'll go up here and change this index from 0 to 6. Now I've got indexes 6, and then 1 through 5, and then 0. The order of these does not matter. Don't worry about rearranging them in here. Once you load it back into the ATEM, if you save it back out again, it will actually put them out in the right order. But the order does not matter. All that matters is that you do not have overlapping index numbers. So this is ready to go. I'll save this. I'm actually going to do a save as so that I have a backup copy, which I always advise doing. And then the way that I like to name my documents is by simply putting a time on there. So I'll just put dash 31, and then if you really want to, you could add another name at the end, a note like reordered macros. Save that, and then we'll switch back over to the ATEM software. From the file menu, choose restore. There's the one I just did. And once I click restore, watch the macros themselves. You'll see A and G trade places. Restore, and there we go. G and A have swapped places. So now when I push button one, on the hardware, it is going to trigger macro G. And that is how you rearrange the macros in your ATEM Mini Extreme or ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. If you're enjoying these tips, be sure to hit subscribe and let me know in the comments below if there's a new tip that you'd like to see in a future video. In this ATEM Mini tip, we're going to look at how you can control a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera connected to an ATEM Mini. We'll start with the software control because you can actually control the Pocket Cinema Camera from any ATEM Mini model. Then we'll look at how you can control the camera via the hardware buttons on the ATEM Mini Extreme and the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. This is all set up in Studio B, so let's go have a look. This is a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K, and it's currently connected to an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. But we're going to start with the software to show how you can control the camera from the software because this works once again on all the ATEM Mini models. From the ATEM software control, go to the camera tab where you'll see access to all of the cameras connected. Now, while it may appear that you can actually control any camera from here, you can't. Even though you see all these controls, no matter what you've connected to the switcher, these controls only do anything if you have the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera connected. Let's start with a tour of the interface. First of all, you'll see that camera one is currently listed as on air. That's camera one, and that's the camera that's currently on air. If I switch to camera two, you'll see that change in the interface here as well. We're also seeing this change on the camera itself. There's a red tally light on the front of the camera that indicates whether it's on air or not. And there's also an indicator on the back of the camera telling me whether it's on air or not, which is really, really convenient in a live situation. Under that, you have three tabs, lift, gamma, and gain. If you're not familiar with those terms, you can think of them like black point, mid, and white point, or shadows, midtones, and highlights, basically the same idea. Each one of these three tabs are individually controlled with the color wheel here. So if I make a change to this under gain and I switch to lift, this will be reset back to where it is. But if I want individual control over all these, I can click this button to expand this out and give me not only three separate wheels, but much larger ones, which makes it all easier to control. Before I start moving these around, let's take a look at the rest of the settings. Here's a reset button. And if you click on that, you can individually reset the lift gamma or gain, or you can choose to reset all. Also, if you've made some changes and you wanna copy these over to other cameras, you can select copy from here and then going to one of the other camera controls, you can click on this and choose to paste or paste to all of the existing cameras. Underneath this, you see a variety of sliders for your filter, gain, shutter, and balance. 
The filter setting honestly doesn't seem to do anything right now, and I couldn't find any reference to it in the manual. This might be a setting that is there for future use, or maybe it only works with the bigger switchers and different types of cameras. I honestly don't know, sorry. And actually, if you do, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to figure this one out. Next to that, you have the gain, which as I adjust, you can see that the exposure is getting brighter or darker. The gain is kind of like the ISO. Base gain is zero. That is your native ISO, if you will, for the camera. That's where you're gonna get the least noise and the best possible picture. Anytime you gain up or gain down, you are increasing or decreasing the exposure, but you're not using the sensor at its prime position, and you're best off leaving it at a gain of zero. And I find that to be especially true with the Blackmagic cameras. They definitely perform best at their native gain. Then you have your shutter speed control and white balance control. With this control pad here, you can drag this knob to the left and right or up and down. Dragging it left and right is affecting the lift, and it's a neutral lift. You can see here that the lift overall is changing as I move this, but the RGB values are staying intact, so we're not affecting the color. By dragging it up and down, I'm opening and closing the aperture of the lens. The coarse slider here is an interesting one in that it allows you to limit how far the aperture can be opened. So if you wanna make sure that you can't accidentally overexpose during a shot, here's how this works. You start by opening the aperture all the way up, and then you take the coarse slider and you slide it down until the exposure is correct, closing the aperture until you get it to the point where you want it to be. Now that that's been lowered, you'll notice that the aperture indicator here has dropped down even though the aperture control is all the way up. What this means now is as I drag this down, I can close the aperture, but even bringing it up all the way to the top will not open it any farther than it was set here as defined by the course slider. Next up, you have focus control. This ring down here allows me to manually focus the camera. So I can drag this back and forth to focus one way or the other. And then the A button here will autofocus it. Now I'm gonna tell you it's not the fastest autofocus in the world, but it'll get the job done. Next, let's take a look at the color adjustments for the lift, gamma, and gain. If I go to the lift tool, I can take the color wheel and push that, for example, towards blue, adding blue into the shadows. I could then go to gain, push it the other way, and add some warmth into the highlights, allowing you to have quite a lot of color control over your scene. Now, what's really cool about this is you can actually save this into macros. So for example, here, I've already created a couple of macros where if I run these, I can choose to reset it back to neutral or add a cool blue look or add a greenish look in there as well. It's pretty neat that you can dial in the controls exactly the way you want them, make your colors match across multiple cameras, and then recall those at any time using macros. Another thing you can do in here is trigger autofocus from the macros. You'll see I have that set up there. So if I move the focus out of focus and then push the auto button, it'll trigger autofocus in there. Now you can technically record the macro of changing the focus manually, but all it records is the change, a little bit up or a little bit down. It doesn't actually record a position. So you can't really use it to, for example, focus from point A to point B. It just doesn't really work that way. You might be able to eke it out if you're really, really careful with your starting and ending points, but it's not really what it's designed for and it doesn't really work that well that way. But the autofocus does work just fine. All right, next up, let's take a look at the hardware buttons on the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. Here you'll see that I have two up and down arrows underneath four other buttons that are listed as gain, black, focus, and shutter. Without any of these four buttons depressed, the up and down arrows here will open and close the aperture, making the image brighter or darker. If I press the gain button while that's lit up, these arrows now adjust the gain. And you can see the adjustment happening over in the software control as well. You also have your black level that you can adjust, the shutter, and even focus. If I press the focus button and then tap the arrows, it will refocus the camera a little bit at a time. Or if I press and hold the focus button for three seconds, that will trigger autofocus. And there we go. Now the camera's in focus. Pairing the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera with the A10 Mini is a pretty great combination. Being able to have this level of control from the software or even the hardware is pretty great. Keep in mind as well that if you're using one of the ISO models, not only can you record the ISO streams as an MP4 file on an attached hard drive, but you can also trigger recording in cameras to record raw in the camera natively, which you can then sync up with the XML file inside of DaVinci Resolve. It's all pretty advanced, so we'll look at that in another video. But for now, just know that connecting one of these cameras to the ATEM is gonna give you a pretty sweet level of control. Hey, that's everything I wanted to show you today. As always, if you have a tip that you want to see, something that's troubling you with your ATEM, let me know in the comments below and I can try and do a video on it. 
And of course, as always, please like, subscribe, and share the video, and I'll see you in the next mini tip. Today's ATEM mini tip isn't really a tip, actually. It's more like a demo with kind of half of a tip thrown in. Basically, I have a piece of gear in the studio right now that's not normally here, and I wanted to show you what it can do with the ATEM that's a, a bit unique. It's pretty cool. Let's go check it out. In the previous tip, I showed you how you can control a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera with the ATEM software control, and in the case of the ATEM Mini Extreme or ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, also with the hardware. There was one facet of that that I did not show you though, and that was zoom. You see, to control a camera's zoom, you actually have to have a powered zoom lens. Otherwise, there's no mechanics or engines to actually move the zoom. Well, today I've got one of those zoom lenses here in the studio. This is a Canon cinema, big, huge, honking, motorized lens. It's, it's pretty cool, actually. And this lens has a powered zoom function on it, meaning that you can control it with a link controller or any other number of devices, but you can also control it from the ATEM software control. Now, there's no hardware buttons on the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO to control the zoom. This is all in software, so let me just show you how this works. You'll notice over here on the camera control, there is a zoom rocker and we're looking through that lens right here, and it's at the widest position, so if I just slowly rotate this up towards the T for telephoto, you'll see that it zooms in. Now this particular lens is actually parfocal, which means if we zoom in all the way, and then let's autofocus that, let it focus right on my eye there, now it should hold that focus point, I'll try not to move my head, as I zoom it out. And as I hold the rocker down all the way, it zooms quickly, or up all the way, it zooms quickly, if I rotate it just a little bit below the line there, you'll see that I can make it zoom quite a bit more slowly and even ramp it up as I move my finger down to make it go a little bit faster or a little bit slower. So you have this level of zoom control, again, only with very specific lenses. Now, of course, this Canon lens isn't the only lens in the world that does this. Any powered zoom lens that is, in this case, an EF mount, or in the case of one of the Micro Four Thirds size pocket cinema cameras, a Micro Four Thirds mount, which would include a couple of Panasonic and a couple of Olympus lenses, not many, but there's a few, you can do the same thing. Now, I used to use a Blackmagic Studio camera, which is basically the SDI Pro version of this little pocket cinema camera here that is meant for broadcast situations, along with a Olympus power zoom lens. And with that, I really didn't have any way to control that over macros, which I always found a little bit disappointing. In getting ready to record this video, I actually was doing a little bit of research and I came across a question that I had posted on the Blackmagic forums years ago. And in there, somebody was talking about how some lenses do actually have certain levels of zoom control. And it really is gonna vary from lens to lens. And while I don't know if I've figured out everything that you can do with this lens, I did figure out something. It's a little weird, but it's kind of cool. So I just wanna show that to you. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the macros palette and I'll create a new macro here. We're just gonna pop it in that first place. And I'll just call this zoom hit record, and then I'm gonna take the zoom button and I'm gonna move it. That's it, I'll stop recording. Now let's go ahead and save this. I'll just call this zoom test, put it on the desktop, and I'm only going to save the macros. Now let's go to the desktop and check this out. There's the file that I just created. And you'll see in here, if we expand this out, that the macro control did recognize something camera control fixed point 16 bit address one category zero parameter nine action set values zero so it recorded something well let's go back over here and see if it actually did anything we'll open the macros and i'll reposition the zoom where it was before right on my ear perfect hit run recall and run and hit zoom and nothing happens i'll go ahead and do this manually let's go back out to wide hit the zoom button again nothing's happening. So triggering the macro as it is now, even though we know that something was there, isn't actually doing anything. But I was looking at the code and I saw that the value is set to zero and that kind of surprised me. A value shouldn't be zero, it should be something. So I tried a bunch of different numbers and here's what I came up with. Between zero and one, at least on this lens, and again, I can't speak to other lenses here, but at least on this lens, a value of zero to one controls the zoom speed. Now, it doesn't control how far it will zoom to. If that's possible, I have not figured that one out, but it will control the speed. So the smaller the number, the slower it zooms, the higher the number up to one, the faster it will zoom. And if you go with a negative number, it will zoom out, a positive number will zoom in. So I've already saved a bunch of these. I'm just gonna go ahead and open up my extra macros here. This is just a bunch of macro code that I saved. I'm gonna copy that 
And I'm gonna go ahead and paste that into here. I'm just gonna drop it in over the one that we just made, index zero. So now you see I have them index zero through nine. And you'll see that I've named them the same as their number values. So this one's name is 0 0.0001 with a value of 0 0.001. And then one less zero to 0 001, 0 001, 0 0.1, and then one, and then negative going the other direction all the way down to negative one. So let's try this out. I'll go ahead and save this. I'll just do a save as, and we'll call this zoom test two. Switch back over to the ATEM software control. Let's go to the restore menu and select that file, test number two, restore that, macros are all that are in there. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the macro list so you can see it populating there, there it is. And we've got all those new macros in place. Okay, we're on the run mode. So let's start with zoom one. So that's gonna be a positive zoom, that's gonna zoom all the way in as fast as it goes. And there it is, it's got my eye back into position here. And let's do zoom minus one as fast as it goes all the way out. Now let's do zoom 0.1 and you'll see that it is now zooming in a bit more slowly. Zoom minus 0.1 will zoom out a bit more slowly. And then I can do 0 0.01, a bit more slowly still. Now I will point out that you can't actually stop these because it's issued a single command. I don't see a way to stop it. So if you're doing this, it's just gonna zoom until it runs out of room to zoom, but it does work. Let's try minus 0.001. And this seems to be the slowest that we can get. If we go to the 0 0.0001, it doesn't appear to make any difference on here. If I hit that 0 0.0001, it does nothing at all. The minus 0 0.001 is the slowest that we can do. And of course you could pick any number in between presumably and make it work. So uh, there you go. Again, more a demo. Most of us aren't gonna run out and buy lenses like this, but if you do have a lens like this and you want to control the zoom, you kind of sort of can. Again, not a huge amount of control, but it's there. In most cases, you're probably just going to use the rocker in the software to do the zoom, but if you want to build a macro around it, you can. That's it for this mini tip slash demo slash half tip. I hope you enjoyed this one. It was kind of fun to figure out once I got my hands on this lens. I got to send this thing back tomorrow, so this is the last I'll have of this one. Thanks again, as always, for watching. If you haven't yet subscribed, please be sure you do. And of course, as always, if there's a tip that you want to see, make sure you let me know in the comments below. I'll do my best to get to it. To connect a camera to your A10 Mini, you of course are going to use an HDMI cable. And HDMI cables come in all shapes and sizes. You can get little itty bitty ones like this, kind of normal size and shape ones like this, or you can get longer ones like this one here. This is a 10 meter or about 33 foot cable, and you can see how big and heavy duty this is. It's thick, it's inflexible, and it is expensive. This one at 10 meters is about half the maximum length. You can go up to about 20 meters, which is the maximum length that you really are supposed to run HDMI. And that's pretty much the longest you're gonna find on the market today, unless you step into the world of HDMI over fiber optics. Now, HDMI over fiber optics used to be really expensive. You had to buy a converter box on one end to convert from HDMI to fiber, and then a long fiber run, and then another box for the other end to convert it from fiber back to HDMI. And this would add up to a lot of money very, very quickly. Well, within the last year or so, something new has come to the market, and that is dedicated fiber HDMI cables. They're a lot more affordable. There's a bunch of brands on Amazon. You can buy them today for cheap, and I've got a couple of them here to show you. Now, while this here is a 30-foot cable, this one right here is 100 feet. This one, 300 feet. This is 300 feet of fiber optic HDMI. I'm kind of afraid to uncoil it, but, um, but there we go. Now, there's a couple of really important things to know about HDMI, and there's a reason that I have two separate cables here to explain the differences. The thing about HDMI is that it is a two-way protocol. Data can transfer both ways down the HDMI cable. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, like what does it matter? You're hooking up a camera to a TV or to an ATEM, you don't need to talk both ways. But having two-way communication gives you two things. For one, it's the convenience of not mattering which end of the cable goes in where. You can take either end of the cable, plug them into the camera or the ATEM, and it doesn't matter. That's standard HDMI. However, fiber optics is one-way communication. With a fiber optic cable, there is an input and an output. In fact, if we look at this one here, you'll see that it has a source and a TV indicator on it. So the source being the camera and the TV, in this case, being the ATEM. If you connect them the wrong way, then you just don't get a signal. Now, that's fine and well for most uses. If you're just using pretty much any digital camera on the market with your ATEM, that is perfectly fine. However, if you're using a Blackmagic camera, specifically a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, and you want to be able to control the camera from the ATEM, 
then you need two-way communication. But all is not lost because there is a branch of the fiber optic cables that are ARC compatible, ARC. And ARC is something that you'll find on modern televisions that is used to communicate with your set-top box. It turns out that that ARC communication, that data path back, is enough to control the camera. So let's have a look at some of these cables on Amazon, and then we'll plug it in and see how it works. This is the 300-foot cable that I have in front of me. It's not available anymore for some reason, but I paid about $115 for it, but you can get a 200-foot one for just $90. So there's an option, but again, that one does not have ARC compatibility, so that one is not going to work with the Blackmagic camera. That said, if you just need a long cable run and you're not using the Blackmagic camera, that cable's perfectly fine. Then let's look at this one. This is a 100-foot cable that is ARC compatible, and this, in fact, is the cable that I have in front of me here. And this cable comes in at just $80. So about the same price as the 200-foot one without the ARC. So again, it depends on what you need. Now, I did actually find a 200-foot fiber optic cable with ARC compatibility, and this one comes in at just $90. I have not tested this cable, so I don't know if it works, but it's good to know that the options are out there. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and plug this thing into the camera and see what happens. So here's the camera end of this. You see it says source on it. I'll go ahead and plug this in. And looking at the multi-view on the ATEM, you'll see, of course, we have picture. And if I switch away from that camera, let's say, let's put it into the preview mode, you'll see it switches over to preview and the light on the front of the camera goes green, telling me that it's in preview mode. If I switch back, it switches over and the camera is now on air, the light goes red and it says on air on the back. But it's not just that communication, I do have full camera control. So if I jump over to the ATEM software, I can control the exposure by changing the aperture there. I can tint the scene. I have full camera control of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera from the ATEM over this fiber optic HDMI cable. That's all I wanted to show you. It's a new thing that's on the market today and it's exciting that we have this ability now for so inexpensively compared to what it used to cost. It's absolutely remarkable. Now, this isn't the only way to go long. You can, of course, go wireless as well. But wireless, while it means you don't have to have a cable running across the floor, does have other issues, more susceptible to dropout, and there's added latency. With this, you get no additional latency. It's just like a regular HDMI cable. So depending on what you're looking for, you're going to find the right product for you. I've got links to these down below. And I guess that's about it. Thanks a bunch for watching. As always, like and subscribe, share, tell a friend, and I'll see you in the next video. The Blackmagic A10 Mini is a great way to take a real camera and feed that into your computer to use as a webcam for Skype, Zoom, whatever you like. But what if you want to take that Zoom call and use that in a live broadcast? Basically, what if you want to take live callers on your live show? Well, that's what we're gonna look at how to set up today. And the good news is you probably already have all the hardware needed to do this. So let's start with a tour of all the different hardware that you will need, and then we'll talk about configuring it and getting it all set up. We're gonna start with the ATEM itself. Now today I'm using the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, and by using the Extreme, I am getting some additional advantages to this. There's a few things that we can do in here that of course we can't do with the smaller ATEM that are gonna make this easier. One of those things I'll show you later on how to do a workaround if you are using the smaller one. One of them is a feature that you just aren't going to have, but that's okay. You can live without it. And the third one is a really nice to have feature, but again, it's not critical. All right, let's get into it. So first, the ATEM Mini Extreme. That's the ATEM that we're using. Next, let's talk about the camera. Today, I'm using a Lumix G7, and I'm using this camera because this is, to my knowledge, the least expensive camera that you can use in a setup like this. The Lumix G7 is a mirrorless camera that has the two things that you need to use them as a webcam. You need to have clean HDMI out. That means that your HDMI output has just the picture and no camera information on it. And you need to have a camera with an audio input or a microphone input. That allows you to hook up an external microphone so that you have something better than just the built-in mics on the camera. So today I've got the G7 along with this little mic, this Rode mic, Rode video. Today I've got this Rode video micro hooked up to it. And I like this microphone for this because it doesn't require any external power or battery. It gets its power from the camera itself. That means that I don't have to worry about a battery dying in the microphone. And speaking of power and batteries, I also have this G7 hooked up to a simple little AC adapter. This allows me to never have to worry about the battery dying in the camera. In fact, with this on there, I can turn the camera on and literally never turn it off. It's pretty convenient to have that. It's actually very affordable, and I've put links to all of this down below as well. So there's the camera. Then I have a monitor hooked up here as well that's plugged into the ATEM. This is allowing me to monitor whatever's happening on the ATEM. And while I'm using a Shogun from Atomos, you can use literally any HDMI monitor, whether it's an old computer display, an old television, anything that you want will work for this. It just needs to have an HDMI input. 
Now you'll see that I've got this configured where the monitor and the camera are very, very close to each other. And I definitely recommend setting it up this way for any kind of Zoom conversation. You're gonna be using this monitor to see your guest, to talk to your guest. And by having it right by the camera, when you're looking at your guest, it's gonna feel more like you're looking at them as opposed to having a conversation where you're looking off to the distance here. So I definitely recommend setting it up that way if you can. Next up, we've got a computer here. This is a laptop. You could use a desktop. It doesn't really matter. We'll come into the configuration for this in a moment. And then I have headphones here. Now, today I'm going to be using these big headphones, but if you're going to be doing this often, I definitely recommend that you invest in some in-ear monitors like these guys here. I'll put links to a couple different options down below, but having that just looks better. It's more discreet sitting in your ear, and it's easy to have one in your ear and one out so that you can hear the outside world as well. It's just a nice, convenient way to go. Okay, so let's talk about configuration. First up, the camera into the ATEM. Simple HDMI out, of course. So it's HDMI from the G7 into the ATEM. And then the ATEM is connected to the computer over USB. So nothing unusual here. USB from the ATEM into the computer allows the software like Zoom, Skype, whatever, to see this camera and the switcher as a simple webcam. Then I've got my headphones plugged into the ATEM itself. And this is one of the situations where the Mini Extreme is going to give us some advantages because it does have a dedicated headphone port. If you don't have that, you can do the monitoring from your computer. It gets a little bit trickier there, but we'll get to that when we come to it. You'll also see up here that I have a Cloner Alliance Flint D4P. This is an HDMI to USB converter. We're using this for the latter part of the configuration. This is kind of one of the bonus features. You definitely don't need to have this for the main setup, but if you can, it's kind of a cool thing to do. All right, so again, the camera is into the ATEM, the ATEM is into the computer. But now, the additional setup. I need to take the computer and loop that back into the ATEM. To do that, I wanna have HDMI out of the computer into the ATEM itself, and in this case, I've got it into input number two. This way, the computer sees the ATEM as a second monitor. How you do the physical connection will depend on your hardware, and I actually recently did a video about how to connect just about anything to the ATEM, including your computer. If your computer has an HDMI output, then just plug that straight in. If you're using a laptop like I am here, the MacBook Air, which just has USB-C outputs, then you need to go from USB-C to HDMI. There are dedicated cables to do this, but today I'm using the Apple AV adapter to go from USB-C to HDMI because that also gives me a USB-C power input, meaning that I can use one port to both power the computer and get the HDMI out, which is gonna be important because I'm gonna need that second port when it comes to the bonus part of hooking up the Flint D4P here. All right, let's get into the computer. Here in my system settings, we can see how the two displays are configured. There's the built-in display, and then this is the Blackmagic ATEM. You can see here that they are not set to mirroring. Now, you can set them to mirroring, but it's actually better if you don't. There's two advantages to not having them mirrored to having them as two separate displays. The first advantage is that you can still use your computer for other things while you're on a call with somebody else. This display will not be what your audience sees, whereas the second display, the ATEM itself, which is where we're gonna put our Zoom caller, that is what your live audience will see. So having those two separate means that you can still use the computer for other things. You can be on there browsing the internet, looking up facts, whatever, while you're talking to your guests. And the second reason is that when you go full screen in Zoom, the entire interface disappears except for one little window that shows you who is actively talking. That little window can be minimized, but it can't be gotten rid of completely unless you have a second screen to drag it off to. So by having these dual display setups, then you can drag that off to a second screen. And again, we're not talking about another complete display. It's simply the computer treating the ATEM as a separate display, giving us that appearance of a second monitor there. Now, if I can bring your attention up to this display, it's currently set to the multi-view out from the ATEM, and so I'm seeing all of my images here. We've got me on the G7 on input one, and then my computer coming in, which I've labeled Zoom on input two. So this allows me to see everything that's happening. But one of the cool things about using the ATEM for this is I can actually switch what I'm seeing on this display from the hardware buttons here. And you have this on the smaller minis as well. So I can be looking at the multi-view as I am now, or I can switch this over to show just my camera input or just my computer screen. And by looking at just the screen here, that allows me to treat this as a true second display from the computer. It's pretty good. Okay, so now let's get Zoom configured. I'll launch Zoom here, and let's go into the preferences. And we're gonna go through the general, the video, and the audio tab. The first thing at the top of the general tab is this option to use dual monitors. And honestly, this just depends on your preferred setup for calls. I'm gonna leave this off for now because it just makes it a little bit easier to run things the way that I wanna run them. But if it works out better for you, you can turn that on. And effectively, when you have dual displays like we have here, then Zoom gives you a second display or a second window that you can manipulate, move around and put different things on. 
I'm gonna leave it off though. I think it's a little bit easier to do this with it set off. Then let's go to the video tab. Under the video tab, you'll set your camera and we've got this set right now to Blackmagic Design. That's the ATEM. And how this actually shows up in your software might be different, but it's showing up as Blackmagic Design here. That's the input, the USB input from the ATEM feeding into the computer. So that's what we want there. You'll also wanna make sure that you have HD enabled on here to ensure that you get the highest quality signal. Next, let's go to audio. For both the speaker and the microphone, you're gonna want them set to the Blackmagic hardware. The names actually show up differently depending on which one they are. I don't know why, just how it is. But under speaker, it shows up as BMD HDMI. And under microphone, it shows up as Blackmagic Design. What this means is that your Zoom caller's audio is going to be fed out of the laptop into the ATEM, which then means you can send this out to your live audience. By having the microphone set to the ATEM as well, this means that you as the host, your audio coming through this microphone will go through the ATEM and be fed back into Zoom. Now you might be thinking at this point, hold on a second, something's not right here. Because if I'm feeding all of the audio from the ATEM back into Zoom, doesn't that mean that the caller is going to hear themselves? And you're right, they would hear themselves. But Zoom is so good at removing its echo and removing its own input that they won't be able to tell at all. It's actually kind of remarkable. It's one of those things that you go, this really shouldn't work, but it does. Zoom is really, really good at this. So you don't have to worry about it. Just set that to the input. And even though they will technically be getting their own audio, your caller will not be able to hear it. Underneath the microphone setting, there's an option to automatically adjust the microphone volume. Definitely turn this off. However, I have to say, I don't think it actually matters. You'll notice here if I try to change the input levels, I can't. It automatically pops back to zero. I think this just has to do with the HDMI audio input. Maybe it's overriding that control, but the UI is still there. But just turn it off to be safe. Next, you want to enable this option to show in-meeting option to enable original sound. Now, to be honest, it probably doesn't really matter, but what this is doing is giving you a little button in your call that allows you to bypass all of Zoom's audio processing when sending audio to your caller. Whether they get audio that's additionally processed by Zoom or not doesn't really matter, but you as the host do want to do any treatment to your audio that needs to be done for background noise removal or just EQing in the ATEM itself because what gets done in the ATEM is what your live audience will hear. It's also what your caller is going to hear. If there's some additional processing on top of that, it's okay. But by having that checkbox enabled, you get that button to bypass all Zoom processing and ensure that your caller hears exactly the same thing that your live audience is hearing. And that's about it. Let's go ahead and close that and I'll start a call. Now I have a computer set up in the other room with my assistant Betty standing by ready to join the call. So let's get her in and then I'll show you how this all comes together. Okay, there we go. Betty has joined. You see I have that original sound option. I'll go ahead and turn that on. And Betty is now connected to this call. So now what I want to do is take this call with Betty in it and move it over to the second display. You'll notice that I have my second display showing up here full screen because I've set the ATEM to display input two. I'll go ahead and take this window, drag it over to here, and then double click on it to make it go full screen. At this point, let your finger off the mouse for a moment and the whole UI disappears and you now have a clean feed of just your caller in there. Now, if I move my mouse around in here, that interface is gonna pop back up. But you'll also notice that over here, I have the window that shows who's on the call. When you first set this up, that window might show up in the middle there, which is what you don't want. So you take that and just drag that off. This way you have a view of who's calling and you have that full clean picture on the screen. Now let's go back to the multi-view and looking on the screen here, we can see that we've got my input, the G7 on input one, and there's the Zoom caller, Betty, coming in on input two. So that's all set up and working great. Now we're ready to start mixing them together to build a show. Now I'm using again, the A10 Mini Extreme, which means I have something called SuperSource. And SuperSource gives me a lot of options and how I wanna configure things. I'm gonna show you just the basics of setting it up. And then I'm gonna run a few macros that I've built to load up different layouts. And then I'm gonna bring in a real caller, a live caller, so that we can find out what it sounds like on their end as well. But first let's get this all set up. I'm gonna switch the program to SuperSource and then open up the super source options where I have a couple of default layouts. You can see what this first layout looks like, but it's a four up, so that doesn't really make sense here. I have a two up display that works pretty good, but of course I can completely customize this. I can change the background, the positioning and everything. So again, I've already got a bunch of these built as macros because I'm on the extreme, I've got macro buttons on here. So I'm gonna just switch first over to macro one. So here's a simple side-by-side -side full screen, split screen conversation. Go to macro two, same idea, inset a little bit with a custom background. 
Macro three, I'm actually gonna be using this in a moment when I bring in my friend Aaron as an actual live caller. And then I've got a simple DVE picture in picture effect, which is actually the type of effect that you can do even with the smaller ATEM. But we'll come to that a little bit more later and I'll show you some better options in this one for doing something like that. All right, the last thing that we need to configure is audio. I'm gonna put my headphones on and at this point, if we look at the audio configuration, you'll see that I have audio coming in from both me, that's me talking, and the Zoom caller. This is actually just music that I have playing in that room. That's what we're seeing here. But here's the really cool thing that we can do with the Mini Extreme. Notice down here this headphone icon. That means solo. I am now only listening to the audio coming from Zoom, not listening to my own audio. See, if I don't, I don't have, have this, this option, option then, then I'm, I'm going to be hearing my own, own audio, audio on, on an, an echo. echo. And in this, this, this isn't okay. Here's what's going on. The audio that's coming through the camera is going out the HDMI out into the ATEM. The thing is that all cameras with an HDMI output have a latency. There is a delay. Some cameras are better than others, but there is always a delay. And this delay off this camera is probably about five to seven frames. So it's enough where if you're hearing your own voice on delay, it's gonna drive you crazy. You, you really, really can't, can't have, have a conversation, conversation where you're hearing your, your own voice, voice on an on echo. echo. Now there's a couple of workarounds here. One of the workarounds is to use a camera like this one. This is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. And even though it too is HDMI out, it has what is probably the lowest latency in the industry. It's still not real time. And I've heard a lot of people say that it is real time, but it's not. If you hook up your microphone to this and you route your HDMI into here and you listen, you will still hear the delay, but it is very slight. It's slight enough that you can probably get away with it. Hold on a medium length conversation and you'll be okay. I wouldn't want to do it all day long, but it's okay for a short call. However, if you want true real-time audio, then the only way to do that is to feed your audio directly into the ATEM. There are, of course, two microphone inputs on the ATEM, so you can feed your audio directly into there. But you can't feed your audio into there and have your video coming from here because then they won't be in sync. If you are using this camera, then run your audio into the ATEM itself. And even though there will still be a slight out of sync, it'll be very, very slight. And I think you'll be able to get away with it. But that is the only way to have truly real-time audio is to feed it directly into the ATEM. And then you don't need to have the solo option. If you don't have the ATEM Extreme and you don't have a camera like this, then you need another solution. I can't plug my headphones into the smaller ATEM Mini Pro ISO. So that means I have to monitor my audio from the computer. But the audio is already being sent from the computer into the ATEM, so I can't monitor it on the headphones as well. There's actually a trick for this. There's a piece of software from Rogue Amoeba called Loopback. Loopback will actually allow you to build virtual interfaces, letting you send the audio from Zoom to both the ATEM and the headphone outport simultaneously. It's a $99 app, so that is an additional purchase you'd have to make. But again, you only need that if you're using the smaller ATEM, which is still a more affordable upgrade than jumping up to the Mini Extreme, but it is an option that you have. Okay, so now we've got our audio sorted out and our video sorted out. Let's get Aaron in here for a real live call and see how that works. How's it going, Aaron? Welcome to my live, not live show. What I've been showing the audience here today is how to bring a live call like a Zoom call and use that as part of a live show. You should be seeing the monitor out or the program out from the ATEM, which means if I switch over to the multi-view setup, the split screen, you're now seeing me in split screen, right? Yep. That's exactly what I see. So as I said, I've got a couple of different macros built already for this. And I have one set up just for our call here where I've got the two of us in an inset with our names underneath. And so that's all set up and ready to go. How do I sound to you, Aaron? I hear you loud and clear. And then how is your audio sounding to you? Are you hearing yourself on this call? I'm not hearing myself through Zoom, nope. So that's the amazing thing that I was talking about where Zoom will take the audio that's being fed back to itself, even though it does include Aaron's own voice and it is removing that for him so he doesn't hear himself. So at this point, we've got this simple two up layout, but what if we wanna bring in a third caller? Well, remember, if we go back to my main screen here, I actually already have a third caller, Betty here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pin her to the call as well. So I'll pin Betty and I'm also gonna pin Aaron in there. So now I've got a side-by-side -side on there. I have built a layout that is using SuperSource that is allowing me to take the split screen from here, these two different pieces, cut them up into two separate inputs and put them all side-by-side. -side. This is giving me the ability to have a dual call, having multiple callers on Zoom and then rearranging that layout and putting that into a live show to send out to the live audience. Now, here's the one other thing I wanted to show you, kind of a bonus move. Aaron, what are you seeing on your screen of me? I am seeing the full layout here. I can see the three up view. 
So Aaron is seeing the three up because I'm sending him the output from the ATEM, the USB-C output. So Aaron's going to see whatever the live audience is saying, which can be great because then he's got the confidence of knowing when he's on air. However, it also means that he's seeing himself with a bit of a delay, and that can be a bit disconcerting. If you're using the ATEM Mini Extreme because it has that second HDMI output, I can actually set this up so that he's getting a clean feed of just me, and then he'll be experiencing what would feel like a normal Zoom call. So the way that I have this configured is the HDMI 2 output from the ATEM is feeding into this Flint D4P. That is then feeding into my computer over USB-C. So now if we look at the Zoom preferences, you can see here what Aaron is seeing. This is the on-air camera. If I switch this over to the Flint, now Aaron is just seeing me. So now Aaron has got a clean feed of me and he doesn't have the whole kind of jumbled seeing himself side by side with me on delay experience. So this is a much cleaner way to do it. Again, to do this, you really do have to have the extreme because you need that second HDMI out, but it's a way to go. Hey, Aaron, we're going to say goodbye. But before we go, when is your next live show? I go live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Thanks a bunch. Make sure you subscribe to Aaron. We'll put a link to his channel down below. We'll see you later, buddy. Bye-bye. So there you have it. Everything you need to know to bring a live caller into your next live show. It is made better by using the ATEM Mini Extreme because you do have more options. But again, you can do all of this with the regular ATEM Mini. You're going to have to route your audio using software through the computer. You're not going to be able to have that clean second HDMI output. And the third thing you're not going to have is the super source, the ability to really reposition things wherever you want. But I did tell you that I would show you a better way to do a split screen using the regular ATEM. So let me show you how to do that now. I'm going to turn off super source. So it's just me in the program now. And then I'm going to enable picture in picture on the ATEM. You have the same picture in picture options on the big ATEM as you do on the little one here. And by default, you have the picture in picture showing up in one of these four corners in there. Just a really simple, small little picture in picture. But you can change that. You can position it wherever you like. So to do this, we go over to the upstream key, which is already turned on. That's the picture in picture that we've got here. And then you can change the settings of this, the position and the size of it. I can take the size up to 50% or I can take it up to 100% to full one to one. And then I can reposition that wherever I'd like. So I've already get this set up as a macro, so let me just activate that, and there's my layout. Now it's not as good as a super source, but it totally works. I've got my guest where I've cut off the edges and moved her off to the side, and now I'm in the background, and so all that really means is I just need to step over to the side to make sure that I'm in the picture. Sure, it means that I have to stand in just the right spot, but my guest doesn't. They can just be center screened, and then I can crop them and push them over to the side. And so this is a very useful way to do this. So that's everything you need to know. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you end up setting up a live show where you're bringing in callers over your ATEM, I want to hear about it. Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks as always. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you in the next ATEM Mini Tip. In today's ATEM Mini Tip, we'll be talking about why and how you might want to connect your ATEM Mini to your network. I'm trying something new on this channel where for the next couple of months, every new video will have ads disabled. No more ads. I know that I don't like watching them and I'm sure you don't either. But what that means is that I'm asking you instead to consider becoming a channel member. If you're benefiting from the videos that I've produced here on YouTube, consider signing up. It costs just 99 cents a month or more if you want to, but that allows you to support me without having to watch ads. So let's get into this tip. We're talking about putting your ATEM Mini onto your network. First why and then how. So let's talk about why to begin with, and let's actually start by talking about what happens if you don't connect it to your network. To start off, the ATEM Mini, by default, connects your computer over USB, a simple USB-C cable from the ATEM Mini hardware into your Mac or PC. This allows you a couple of things. It gives you complete control over the hardware, switching, adding graphics, changing audio settings, and so on. Plus, it allows you to see your ATEM Mini as a webcam in software like Skype or Zoom. And if that's all you need out of your ATEM, and that's great. You probably don't need to watch this video. Hope to see you in the next one. But for those of you who do want to take it to the next level, here's why you might want to add your ATEM to the network. First of all, if you want to stream from the ATEM hardware itself, meaning streaming to YouTube, Facebook, whatever, then you need to have your ATEM on your network. It needs internet access, and the way that it gets that is by connecting to your local network. So that's the first one. But even if you're not live streaming from it, you can still benefit by putting it on your network. For example, you could access the same hardware from multiple computers on the network even at the same time, meaning you could have one computer doing the live switching while another one is controlling audio and yet another one is controlling graphics. So that's something you can do when you have the hardware on the network. Or you might want to be controlling it from third-party solutions like Companion on your desktop 
or even apps like MixEffect on your iPad. There's lots of third-party solutions for controlling your hardware remotely, but all of those require a network connection. So let's first start with the connection over USB. I currently have this connected over USB, but not to my network. And if we look over here at my computer, you'll see that I have the A10 Mini Pro ISO connected. And if you look at this little icon right here, that USB symbol tells me that it is connected to the computer over USB. At this point, again, I have complete control over it. But if I want to add it to the network, then all I have to do is plug the Ethernet cable into the ATEM and the other end into my network. Okay, well, what does that actually mean? Well, let's back up a minute and talk about that. This is going to depend on the type of network you have and the type of environment that you're in. Let's start with the most basic. You're just using this at home. At home, you have some type of internet coming into your house over cable, fiber, whatever it might be, but it's coming into a modem. Somewhere in your house, you have a modem that's got a cable running in from the outside. From that modem, it might be connected to a Wi-Fi router. That Wi-Fi router is what gives you Wi-Fi connection throughout your house, and that might be all you have. In fact, you might even have a single box that is both the modem and the Wi-Fi router all in one. Either way, there's going to be an Ethernet connection somewhere on that router or on the modem and router combo. That LAN connection means that you can connect an Ethernet cable like this one into there and then the other end into a computer or some other device to give it direct network access. Well, why would you want to do that? Why not just connect everything over Wi-Fi? While Wi-Fi is great for things like watching video or browsing the web, it's not so good for live streaming. So the ATEMs don't even have Wi-Fi built into them for this exact reason. All right, so that's why we're not going to use Wi-Fi. So let's get back to connecting this. Where are we going to plug this in? Again, into that LAN port on your router or your modem. But what if that port is already taken? Maybe you already have a computer or other device on your network that's plugged into that, taking up that one port. Well, that's an easy solution. There's something called a network switch or network hub that you can add to your network, giving you additional ports. And that'll allow you to connect multiple devices over the hardwire directly into your system. Beyond that, there's a lot of ways that you can get even bigger and more extensive on this. But if you are into a system like that, then you're not going to gain anything from this part of that video. So let's just move on. All right, so you're going to plug one end of this cable into your network and the other end into the ATEM. Before I do this, though, let's take another look at the software. From the ATEM setup app, if I go into the settings, we'll see in here on the first page, network settings, and you'll see that it currently has an IP address of zero, basically meaning it doesn't have an address. This tells me that it's not on the network. So I'm going to go ahead and connect this Ethernet cable to the ATEM. And in just a few moments, over in the software, we'll see that it gets an IP address. In my case, 10.0.1.57. This tells me that the hardware is now on the network. So now let's back out of this, and you'll see here that the logo next to the A10 Mini Pro ISO name has updated. We're seeing both USB and an Ethernet connection icon. That tells me once again that it's connected both over USB and over Ethernet. Now I can actually unplug the USB connection. As soon as I do that, you'll see the USB symbol goes away. This tells me now that I'm connected only over the network. To control this, if I launch the ATEM software, in just a moment, it'll update, and we now see that we're controlling the hardware. I can click on camera one, camera two in here, and we'll see that those settings are changing both in software and on the hardware. So now I've connected the ATEM to the network, and I've disconnected the USB. What have I lost? What have I gained? We've already talked about what I've gained by connecting it to the network, but I've lost something by disconnecting the USB. I no longer have the ability to treat the ATEM Mini as a webcam in software like Skype or Zoom. But I've actually gained something on USB as well. I've gained the ability now to connect an external hard drive to the ATEM to record the program, or if you're using one of the ISO models, the program and the ISOs directly to that hard drive. Unfortunately, with the ATEM Mini, ATEM Mini Pro, or ATEM Mini Pro ISO, you can't do both at once. You can't record the show and use it as a webcam because there's only one USB port. If you need to do that, then there you're going to want to buy the ATEM Mini Extreme. The Extreme model has dual USB ports, meaning that you can connect both the ATEM as a webcam and connect it to a hard drive at the same time. But now that I've got my hardware on the network, once again, I can connect to it from multiple computers or even from an iPad. So here, I'm running an app called MixEffect. You can see my network address there of 10.0.1.57. And if I tap Connect, it's going to go ahead and connect to my ATEM Mini. From here, I can now do the switching in software just as I could on the computer, but now using the iOS app. But now if we look at all three of these at the same time, you can see that they're all talking to the same hardware both apps are communicating with the same device at the same time. So that's the how and why you might want to connect your ATEM Mini to the network. If you have any questions about this, drop them in the comments below. And if there's a specific tip that you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below as well. I'll add it to my list and be sure to get that done for you. Take care. We'll see you in the next video. In this ATEM Mini tip, we're going to talk about how you can use your cellular connection as either a backup 
or a primary network connection for your live streams. Now, setting either of those up is actually really easy. The tricky part, though, is setting it up so that your computer and your ATEM can talk to each other even when you're off of your local network and the USB port is being used by your phone. This video picks up where we left off in video number 15, where I showed you how to get your ATEM onto your local network. Once the ATEM is on the network, you can use the ATEM to stream directly to YouTube, Facebook, or wherever directly from the hardware using its built-in encoder. If you want to have a backup connection using your cell phone, this is actually really easy to configure. First of all, you're going to need to have a cellular plan that allows tethering. Assuming that you do, then all you have to do is connect the phone to the ATEM and it will just see it as an optional streaming device. It's actually really easy to do. Let's just do that first. I'll take a Lightning to USB-C cable and I'll plug this into the back of the ATEM. And then let's take a look over at the ATEM software. If I go into the settings, you'll see that I have a connection priority option as Ethernet or mobile. By setting the priority, you're telling the ATEM which connection you want it to use first. And for most cases, you're gonna want it to be the Ethernet connection. That's using your local network, for your primary stream and then only relying on your phone as a backup. Now let's verify that the phone is actually being seen by the ATEM. I'll launch the ATEM software and under the live streaming connection, you'll see there's a new symbol here, a little phone icon that's currently grayed out. This tells me that the hardware sees the phone as an optional connection. Now let's go ahead and start live streaming. You can see that we're now on air and the cellular icon is still gray, telling me that it's in standby mode. Now let's go ahead and just yank the ethernet connection out of the ATEM as if it lost connection to the network. First of all, as soon as I did that, I lost connection to the ATEM from the computer. But if we look at the multi-view out, you'll see that that icon in the corner has gone red, telling me that it is now streaming using my cellular connection. Now let's say we get our network access back. I'll go ahead and plug that back in. And it'll take a few moments, but eventually, the ATEM software shows up on the network again, and after a few moments, the live stream switches back to the Ethernet connection. Okay, so that's everything you need to do to set it up as a backup. Really straightforward. If you're in a studio environment like this, but you can't use your local internet connection for whatever reason, maybe your ISP is down, but you still want to go live, then you can go ahead and leave everything set up as it is, but set the priority to be the cell phone. To do that, I'll go back to the ATEM setup app, open the settings, and switch the connection priority from Ethernet to mobile. As soon as I do that, you'll see that that icon turns blue, telling me that it's the primary connection and ready to go live. Okay, so that's what we need to do to set it up so that it can stream either as a backup or using your mobile as a primary connection. But what if we're out in the field? Let's say that we're gonna go out somewhere remote. We're going to take the ATEM and my computer and my cameras and everything else and do a live stream from the mountaintop. I've got power sorted out for the ATEM, but of course I'm gonna rely on the internet connection from my cellular phone to do the live stream. That's all well and good, but how am I going to control the ATEM from my computer? How am I going to load graphics and do all the other things that I would normally do from a computer? Well, normally you'd use the USB connection, but I can't because that's being taken up by this. Okay, then that's what the network connection is for, right? Well, the thing is that I don't have a network to connect to anymore. If I plug my ATEM directly into the computer via Ethernet, that's not going to, by default at least, just work. So we need to set it up so that it does work. It's a pretty simple network configuration, but you do need to set this up. So let's get into that. I'll go back over to the ATEM setup, jump into the settings again, and you'll notice up here that it says connect using USB to adjust the network settings. To change the network settings, I have to make a USB connection. Now, this is a really important point. It's obvious right now because it's telling me and so I'm going to do that, but it's important to remember this because once you set everything up and you go out in the field and you do your event and then you come back and a week later you go to put your ATEM back on your network and you plug it into the ethernet connection, it won't show up on your network because it is still set to be looking for your computer directly, which we're about to configure. You won't know what's wrong because you'll have no interface telling you what's wrong. It simply won't be there. The reason being that you'll need to reconnect over USB to reset the network back to the way it was. So again, just reminding you that once you set this up over USB, you'll have to put it back the way it was using USB as well. All right, let's do this. I'll go ahead and disconnect the cell phone for now take the USB cable that is plugged into the computer. I'll exit out of the settings and jump right back into them again. And now I have setup control for my network. So by default, it's set to DHCP, which means that the ATEM is going to get an address assigned to it by the router on your network. But we're removing that router from the equation. So now we need to set this up manually. To do that, I'll switch over to static IP. 
And at this point, some of these numbers might change. Some of them may stay the same from the way you had it before. But now we need to set it up with the right numbers so the two pieces of hardware can talk to each other. Effectively, what we're going to do is build a tiny little network. The numbers that we enter in here don't actually matter that much as long as they're in the right format and we have some of the same numbers between the two devices. I'll show you. You can use these same numbers for your setup if you want to or different ones. It really doesn't matter. I'm going to use an IP address of 192.0.0.3, subnet mask of 255.255.0.0, and then a gateway of 192.0.0.1. Now, this gateway is very important. The gateway address and the IP address have to have the same numbers in the first three positions. So again here, 192, and then dot zero, and then dot zero. Then we have the final number. The gateway IP typically ends in one. This is also called the router field. Now we don't have a router, so the computer is going to become the router effectively for this. But again, we're setting that IP address to one at the end. So 192.0.0.1. I've set this IP address to 0 0.3, and on the computer, I'm gonna set it to 0 0.2. Again, for the IP address, it doesn't matter as long as those two numbers at the very end are different from each other and the first three numbers are the same across the devices. I'll move this over to the side and open up my computer's network settings next. Here you'll see that I'm currently connected to my Wi-Fi network, but to ensure that I set this up properly and that I'm not accidentally seeing the devices across the network, I'm actually going to turn off Wi-Fi to ensure that there's no way that I'm possibly connected to my actual local network here. I'll turn that off. And then I'm gonna set a new location here. Now this is not necessary. This just makes it easier to switch back and forth between your home or studio or work location and some other location where all your network settings change at once. It's totally up to you if you set this up or not. Now, I'm obviously on a Mac here. If you're doing this on a Windows PC, I know that there are very similar network configurations on Windows. I don't know exactly what they are, but following the same guideline, you should be able to sort this out. I'm gonna create a new location and call this ATEM in the wild. And now I'm ready to configure an IP address just like I did on the ATEM. Because my Mac doesn't have a built-in Ethernet port, I need to use an adapter. So I've got that right here. This is a simple Belkin USB-C to Ethernet adapter connected to an Ethernet cable, and the other end of that is right here. Let's go ahead and take the ATEM off of my local network and plug it into this cable here. I'll take the other end of this and plug it into my Mac. As soon as I do, you'll see that a new network interface has become available, the Belkin USB-C to LAN adapter. Now I'll go ahead and configure the IP address manually, just as I did for the ATEM, and here's where I need to enter the same numbers. I'll start with the IP address here. Copy and paste that in, but of course I need to make it different, so I'll set that to dot two. Then I'll take my subnet mask and paste that in, and the gateway, which has to be the same, set in there. Click apply, and that's it. So again, the router or gateway are the same, the subnet mask is the same, and the IP addresses are different. Now we're ready to test this out, but make sure that you save the settings in the ATEM setup first. I'll go ahead and click save here. And then to test this, I'm going to just yank out that USB connection and they should find each other over the local network that we just set up. The ATEM mini still shows up on the network here. If I click on the setup, we'll see that it must be talking to it because it has an IP address and I'm able to get into it. And if I launch the ATEM software, we'll see it connects. And there we go. The ATEM and the computer are talking to each other. Next, we need to set the cellular connection to be the primary connection, not the backup. Otherwise, as soon as I try to go live, the ATEM, seeing this network, is going to try to use this computer to live stream. But of course, this computer doesn't actually have an internet connection. So let's make sure we change that. We'll go back over to the ATEM setup, jump into the settings, and ensure that the connection priority is set to mobile. It is, so that means we're ready to go. Finally, I'll just go ahead and reconnect my phone to the ATEM. Back over to the ATEM software. We see that blue icon which means we're ready to go. Click on air, and there we have it. I'm now live streaming using the cellular connection from my iPhone. If you have any questions about setting up this network configuration, please drop them in the comments below. This can get a little bit tricky, but as long as you get the right numbers in there, everything should just work. Thanks as always for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please be sure you do that. Don't forget to share this video, hit that like button. And also remember that I'm now publishing videos without ads. If you've gotten this far and you've learned something from this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. It costs as little as 99 cents a month. You can pay a little bit more if you want to, but 99 cents a month is all it takes to become a channel member, and that will help to support this channel so that I don't have to run ads on the videos, which I think we can all agree is a better way to watch YouTube. Thanks a bunch for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.